Our theme is continuing to be, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. faced with the pandemic crisis. We've been very fortunate here in Texas County not to be affected directly yet. It's my prayer that continues. Before we go on, let's have a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we've gathered here, Lord, I ask for your presence to come down among us and those watching today. Let your spirit minister to us to encourage us and to direct us in our lives with your guidance that we can be the kind of followers that you want us to be to reach out to our world during this time of need. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue our musical worship.
Thank you, Susan. Recently, I had the opportunity to spend some time with our weekday preschoolers, the two-year-olds in particular, and I led them into a rousing game of follow the leader. They were excited. The pastor was going to play with them. And so I walked around in a circle doing all kinds of weird things. We'd hit each other over the head, and we'd touch our noses, and then we'd do this, and then we'd do this, and we did some jumping jacks. And they had a great time. Within 15 minutes, I was exhausted about the collapse, but they wanted to continue to do it. <laughs> now, they didn't know why they did what they did. They simply followed the leader because he was the leader, and they loved every minute of it. You know, we are responsible as Christians to follow our leader as well. And that leader is Jesus Christ. It tells us in Luke 9, 23, Then Jesus said to them all, talking about all the disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must first deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. What Jesus was saying is our whole life is to be follow the leader. It says in this passage, first of all, that we are to come after Jesus. That's what the kids did that day. I led, they came after me, mimicking everything I did. And when we are a Christian, it means to come after Jesus, seeking to personally follow him and connect to him. It's not a religious obligation or a set of rules or a set of rituals. That's man's religion. Follow the leader is a connection to Jesus, a relationship. When I was in the military, we followed the leader by obeying orders. And ours was not the reason why, ours was but to do and die, as the poet said. Sometimes those orders made no sense. Sometimes we had to do things we really didn't want to do. <laughs> but at the same time, our responsibility was to follow our leaders. Also coming after Jesus is to have faith. Now what's faith? It's not just believing something exists. It's more than that. In the original Greek, pistis, it means to trust completely and commit completely to someone or something. And our faith is not in religion. Our faith is in our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. As the Son of God and Lord of our lives, He can and expects us to trust Him and commit ourselves to Him even when there's times we don't understand why he's leading us the way he is. And this is how we personally connect with him. Coming after Jesus also shows a proper relationship between us and him. He's the leader, we're the followers. Now, Jesus is our friend, there's no question about that. But he's more than that. He's our Lord. A friend is often a peer relationship that's equal. Well, he's more than that. He's our leader. He's our Lord. And sometimes we want to turn Jesus just into a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. Certainly true. But if that's where you stop, then you can feel free to disagree with Jesus. Then you can feel free to do what you think you should do because you put yourself on an equal level to Jesus Christ. Yes, he's our friend, but more importantly, he is our Lord, our Savior, our leader. We don't dictate to Jesus. Jesus dictates to us. Now, if I would go into a group of adults and say, hey, let's follow the leader, let's play that game, and I started doing the same things I did with those two-year-olds, the adults would look at me and think I was crazy. <laughs> they would say, why do we have to do this? This is stupid. This makes no sense. But the fact is, sometimes Jesus asks us, directs us both through scripture and as he guides us in our lives to do some things that don't make sense to us, things we don't want to do. And when we understand that we are to come after Jesus, to follow him as our leader, we know to do it no matter how dumb it seems, no matter how nonsensical it seems, no matter how illogical it seems, no matter how unrealistic it seems, we follow the leader. But too often as adults, we tend to filter what Jesus tells us to do in our lives, both through scripture, the preaching and the teaching, the leadership of church leaders, as well as personal guidance in our life, as options. In other words, we'll do it if we think it's a good idea. 
And if we don't think it's a good idea, we don't agree, we just don't do it. We choose to say no. But that's not what coming after Jesus is all about. But it goes on in this passage, and it says that coming after Jesus requires, our, requires us to deny our self. Now, the word self, often in the Greek in the New Testament, is translated as flesh in the original Greek. And that means something more than just our person. It is the inner desires that we have in our lives, our appetites, our, our general propensity to want to be in control, to do things our own way, to do what we want to do, to feel good, and to satisfy our appetites in our life. That is what the self is. And so what Jesus is saying here is that we need to deny our self, our own personal desires, our own personal objectives, our own personal agendas. And we are to instead take up our cross and follow him. Now, denying ourselves means to live a life of living sacrifice. It says in Romans 12, 3, I urge you, brothers, in the view of God's mercy, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, Christians throughout the centuries have literally sacrificed their lives, going to death for the cause of Christ. Most recently, we had some missionaries in Africa that were killed by, by uh, tribesmen that were non-believers because the tribesmen saw them as threats. They gave their lives for Jesus Christ. Well, here in, in Romans 12, uh, uh, 1, we are being told that we are to live a life of living sacrifice. We may not die physically, but we are to sacrifice ourselves. We're to die to ourself, our control of our own lives, and instead we're to do what Jesus wants, to do, wants us to do. How do you live a life of living sacrifice? By dying to yourself. Denying yourself also is the desired action to give up the driver's seat of your total life. Now, we don't mind giving Jesus parts of our life, the religious parts, but during the week we often make our decisions in our lives based on what we want, without an attitude of asking God what he wants in our life. Everything from uh, the jobs we do, to where we live, to what we do in our free time. And we need to understand that when we live a life of living sacrifice, we are giving up the ownership of all of our life. Everything we are and we own, including our own desires to Jesus. A few years ago, the Lord gave me the opportunity to buy a pickup truck. It was used. It had a lot of miles. It was over 20 years old, but it was my first one. I was thrilled to have it. I felt God gave me the opportunity to buy it. Now, I remember saying to the Lord, Lord, you've given me this chance to get this truck. It is your truck to use for your work. I didn't expect just three weeks later to get a phone call from a friend saying, hey, there's a lady in my apartment complex that needs a move a bunch of furniture to an apartment. Would you help? My first response is, no, I don't want to help. I just want to sit here and watch TV. I don't want to do it. She doesn't go to my church. Why should I do it? Well, the fact is, God gave me that truck to use for his work. And he reminded me that very moment, it's my truck. You are mine. I want you to do this. Now, it turned out to be a blessing, though it turned out to be several days of moving her, her furniture items and personal items to her new apartment. Uh, and what was thrilling was I got to know her. She was a wonderful lady, and she ended up coming to our church later on. Her name was Dorothy. I had the opportunity to serve the Lord, and it felt good. But even if it hadn't felt good, even if that did not enter into it, I was to live a life of living sacrifice. It was God's truck, not Russ's truck. It's God's Russ, not Russ's Russ. And denying yourself also, we need to understand, is not masochistic asceticism. Now, what does that mean? It means believing that you have to make yourself miserable and cause yourself pain. Denial of anything that might be pleasurable in your life or fulfilling. I've had people sometimes feel guilty because they're enjoying what they're doing in, in their life. 
They're enjoying what God's giving him, uh, giving them. And so they're saying to themselves, I must not be in God's will because I'm happy and joyful. Well, guess what? God did not call you to be miserable. He called you to be sacrificial. And we will have, through that living sacrifice, joy and fulfillment will be on God's terms, not on what we think we need to do to make our lives happy. There's a story of a saint in the Middle Ages who was a strong masochistic, uh, masochistic ascetic. And what he would do would be go through his life denying himself anything whatsoever that might be pleasurable. He would only eat bread and water. And after a while, because of his poor diet, he developed sores. And maggots started to grow in those sores. One day he saw some of the maggots fall off as they were eating his skin. He picked them up and put them back on the sore because he felt like he needed to do that to be miserable for the sake of Jesus. Folks, that's not what we're talking about, denying ourselves. We deny ourselves as God calls us to deny ourselves. Yes, we may experience pain. We may experience momentary misery at times, doing what God wants us to do. But we do not have to have a life of living in some kind of a dungeon on a concrete floor, eating just bread and water to prove we really love Jesus. That's not what he's talking about here. But denying ourselves all, but does that mean? That means also the willingness to give up the easy and comfortable life as God dictates to us. Now, a lot of, a lot of us live what I call a lazy boy recliner life. We're couch potatoes. And we spend a lot of our time just taking it easy, doing our own thing. And sometimes that's okay with God. But other times, he wants to give us greater challenges and greater adventures in serving him. And the ultimate satisfaction that actually comes from seeing God use us in a powerful way. Our youth minister, Andy Wells, was in the emergency room last night with terrible leg pain. And as he was uh, getting an ultrasound of his leg, he had the opportunity to talk with the sound technician about Jesus. She asked a question. He had a big cross tattoo on his arm that some, by the way, had been critical of. But Jesus used that night. She asked, tell me about that cross. So he began to talk about what that cross meant to him. And then he asked her, are you a Christian? And she goes, I don't know. I'm not sure what that means. So he began to share with her what it meant to be a Christian. At the end, she prayed to receive Christ. And she cried. And she said, I need my children in church too. What happened in that situation was Andy saw the opportunity, the challenge that God gave him. He could have been so inward focused on the pain in his leg, but instead he was sensitive to the opportunity to share with that ultrasound technician, and she accepted Christ. Isn't that great? He called me today and talked almost an hour about it. He was so excited. He rose up to the challenge that God gave him when he could have easily said, you know, I'm not feeling good. I don't want to have to communicate with anybody. I just want to sit here and feel sorry for myself and have a pity party because my leg hurts so bad. He didn't do that. Denying ourselves means looking for those opportunities and challenges and rising to the occasion, leaving behind our own personal wants, our own personal desires. But it goes on to say that not only we're to die ourselves, we are to take up our cross. We are to replace ourself with the cross that Jesus gives us. And it says we need to do it daily, not once a week on Sunday morning, but every day. Cross-bearing is not necessarily great physical suffering, though it was for Jesus. It can be, but it may, may not be. But cross-bearing is always finding God's ministry and mission for your life. With single-minded dedication, that's what Jesus did when he went to the cross. He came here on a mission. And with single-minded dedication, he continued on that mission until he completed it. We need to find our mission, our ministry, and with single-minded dedication, go forward until we complete it, whatever that is for God's life. It's not necessarily your career. It's not your family, though that's important. It's what God has called you to do. Christ bearing, a uh, cross bearing for Christ is bearing his life in your life to accomplish what he wants. He was the Savior of the world. He did it. We need to do it too. 
And what's your cross? Well, that's for God to tell you. If I can tell you one thing, you don't pick your cross. God picks it for you. That ministry of sacrifice to accomplish God's mission in your life. I know for me, it turned out to go into professional ministry. Believe me, that was not my goal. I had other plans. I had my career planned out. I already knew I was going to major in, in college, even at 15 and 16 years old. And then God suddenly came along and said, nope, i got a different plan. This is what I did. I, first of all, said, no, God, you know, I'm not the minister type. And there are some people today who would, would agree with that. How about me just be a great Sunday school teacher or a great deacon or a leader in the church and still I can live my life and my career the way I want? He said, no. Your cross is to do that. Now, I'm glad I did it. But, you know, it took three months of struggle and fighting with the Lord for me to finally surrender into the ministry and follow him. I couldn't imagine ever being happy bearing this particular cross for Jesus, being a professional minister. Think about that. I was supposed to hang around the church building all day praying and visiting sick people and old people. How, how can that possibly be fulfilling? But yet I found myself wondering how I could have done anything else at this point in my life. Because God knows better than you do what your mission and your ministry is. That's your cross. Now, maybe your cross will require you to go to death, as Jesus is dead. But for 99% of us, it'll simply be living a life of living sacrifice, denying ourselves and fulfilling the mission that God has for our life. You might call yourself a auto mechanic or an engineer or a business owner. But in reality, you're a cross bearer. And all those other things you do as a vocation, are simply to provide for you so you can do the real work that God has for you. Now, cross-bearing can sometimes require humiliation and suffering, and certainly sacrifice in various ways. Bearing your cross is not going to be easy. People won't necessarily celebrate you for doing it or glorify you for doing it. Sometimes that happens, often it doesn't. Sometimes people don't even notice what you're doing, but God does. Remember when Jesus carried his cross, literally, they were ridiculing him. They were spitting on him. They were humiliating him. But he still bore his cross and eventually died on it. And cross-bearing is done daily, it says in this passage. Not when it's convenient. Not a day or two a week. It's done every day in every part of our lives, including our career, our family, our friendships, and our community. Not just sitting in church. I mentioned Andy earlier. He could have easily said, hey, I'm not doing my youth director thing right now. I'm not on the clock. I'm here hurting right now. But at that particular moment, in the middle of the night, he had the chance to share. And daily means we renew our commitment every day to bear our cross. When we wake up in the morning, you ask the Lord, Lord, I'm willing to bear my cross. What's your marching orders for today? Specifically, what do you want me to do? Throughout the day, do you ask yourself, Lord, is there an opportunity I'm missing to serve you in some way, to glorify you in some way? It's a 24-7 commitment to the Lord all the time. And we need to bear our cross voluntarily and willingly and with love, just as Jesus did himself. Now, why don't we take up our cross more often? Well, it's inconvenient. Sometimes we say, it's, I don't have enough time. I have other priorities than the, to bear my cross, to do my mission for the Lord. I can't squeeze in anymore in my time. Sometimes we just don't want to. We want to do our own thing. But coming after Jesus, remember, always requires that we follow Jesus. His direction for our life. To follow Jesus should be our only purpose in life as we bear our own personal cross for him. Are you bearing your cross for Jesus today? Are you daily asking him, what can I do? What are your marching orders for me to accomplish your mission in my life? Are you denying self, all your self-centered personal agendas for the sake of Jesus? Jesus will still allow you to do a lot of things 
they're building them fun. If you're a big fish fisherman, he's not going to say you can't fish anymore to prove you bear your cross. He'll still allow that, but you do it in the context of his larger plan for your life. Right now we have a great opportunity as Christians as the world is suffering and looking for answers. Let us all make a new commitment to bear our cross daily, to deny ourselves and follow Jesus. And as we close, I just want to share some prayer requests. First of all, I want to share a praise. Today, in Texas County, we still have no confirmed cases of the COVID-19 China virus. Isn't that great? I believe our prayers are making a difference in that area. Now, I know that there are other people praying just as fervently in other counties that are not experiencing what we're getting to experience. My prayers are for them as well. But I think God's at work. And I praise him for the fact he's protected us. Let's use this time while we're not sick to make a difference in the, in the lives of others. Don't forget the Fry family and the, and the loss of, of their son-in-law, Chris Purvis. Renee Purvis, uh, his wife, and Frank and Doris's daughter, as well as Karen, the other daughter, as they suffer through the sudden loss. Let's also remember Alyssa Meeks, as she's still, Merckx, as she's still in Children's Hospital up in St. Louis with a very, very, very serious heart condition, which may take her life. We need to pray for her, for God's healing, but also to pray for Mindy and Tyler, uh, her parents, who are struggling and suffering right now through this. And let's pray for one more thing. Let's pray for revival to break out in America. We have an opportunity. Let's pray like we've never prayed before. Let's serve like we've never served before. Let's praise God like we've never praised God before. And see God work in a great and mighty way. And by the way, revival doesn't start with the other guy. Revival starts with you. Getting right with God. Repenting of your sin. Recommitting your life again totally to him. Denying yourself. Taking up your cross. Daily and without following Jesus. Then revival can begin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we close this time, I thank you for this opportunity we can have to open up your written word and to learn from what you have to say, to have you speak directly to our lives. And Lord, as we have heard you speak, Lord, I ask that you lay on our hearts, each one of us, what it means for us to come after you, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross daily and to follow you. Lord, I am thankful so much for the fact that we've not been struck with the same illness that so many other people are experiencing in America. My prayers are for them that you work in a mighty way to to heal, to protect those who are selflessly serving in the medical field in other ways. And Lord, also this may be a great opportunity for them to become open to you as they struggle with this kind of need. And we ask that you use all of us as Christians to reach out to them in love. Lord, I thank you for the fact we have not been hit. And use us because you've saved us so far. You've protected us to serve you in a greater way. Lord, I lift up to you Andy Wells with his leg pain. We ask for your healing power in his life to guide the doctors on the source of the problem. Lord, I ask you to be with the uh, Purvis family and the Fry family and the loss of Chris. Lord, I ask for your consolation and, and for your spirit to comfort and give them peace during this time. Lord, as Alyssa Merckx has a very serious situation, we ask for your healing power. I know that they know you and they love you, that they... That they have accepted you as Lord and Savior, so I ask that you just touch them in a special way. Walk with them during this time, give them comfort, and to guide the doctors, as well as working supernatural with your healing power in her life. And Lord, I ask that revival break out in America. And I know it begins with me and with the people in this community. Lord, break our hearts. Show us where we have failed you. Guide us that we can glorify you in a greater way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much for being with us today.